Now at 6 and streaming on CrossroadsToday.com, we hear from two candidates running for Victoria County Commissioner. And a Texas man could become the first person executed in the U.S. under a murder conviction tied to shaken baby syndrome. Plus, investigators have narrowed in on a location in the search for a missing mother. We had another hot day over the crossroads, but guess what? This frontal system is going to knock us down, down to the eight, maybe even the low, maybe even the upper 70s. Can you believe that? We'll be talking about it coming up in a moment. And the Yoakum Bulldogs are trying to focus their attention this week to the number one ranked team in the Columbus Cardinals this Friday night. That's coming up in sports. You're watching 25 News Now at 6. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Shauna Curry. Don Brubaker is off tonight. As Election Day is around the corner, two candidates are fighting for the Victoria County Commissioner spot in Precinct 1. Danny Garcia has held the position for three terms or 12 years. Challenger Kenneth Wells is a deputy for the Victoria County Sheriff's Office. He has served as a law enforcement officer for 27 years. Both candidates say they want to serve as the voice for the community of Bloomington and all of Victoria County. Always um, being, being available um, to be the person that people can come to when they need help. The other thing is uh, facilitating a healthy relationship with our city council and our school board. Um, be a better representative for uh, precinct one as, as a whole. Uh, there are several things that, uh, several projects that I want to be a part of. The community center is a huge, huge factor. Early voting starts on Monday, October 21st, and early voting takes place at the Dr. Patty Dodson Public Health Center. A reminder to drivers that part of Airline Road will be closed overnight tonight. The section of Airline Road between Main Street and Navarro Street will close at 10 o'clock tonight for a utility tie-in. This is part of the construction of the public safety headquarters. The road will reopen at 3 tomorrow morning. Motorists should drive cautiously and obey all signs and barricades posted in the work zone. Through traffic can avoid delays by seeking alternate routes. Well, today is free admission day at the Calhoun County Fair, and tomorrow Mac is going to be down there joining in on some of the fun for the Calhoun County Fair. So we wanted to know from viewers today which part of the county fair is your favorite. Is it the carnival rides? Is it the stock show, the auction, the food? We want to hear from you. Come to crossroadstoday.com slash vote to participate. And uh, over half of you say the best part is the food, which is great because a lot of the food vendors are, are local business owners as well. So um, continue to vote and we'll have the latest results on 25 News Now at 10. And Mac, I think uh, another favorite part this year at least might be some cooler temperatures coming. Yes, I got it all wired up. You know, I'm going to go be there live at the Calhoun County Fair and we invite all of you to come out. But, you know, the whole purpose of that is to see what the projects that the kids have done. And uh, my cousins were always winning blue ribbons and this and blue ribbons and that. So that's an important part of the fair as well. We'll see you down there tomorrow. We've got this frontal system, folks. Today it was 95. Tomorrow it's going to be about 78, 79. And that's the high temperature. We'll talk about that coming up a little bit later on. Back to you, John. All right, thanks, Mac. We'll be sure to catch the next episode of Let's Grow Texas Ag, which digs into the agriculture impact in the crossroads. In this episode, Joe Adams heads to Jackson County to talk with Joey Burris and Jerome Rosapal. You can catch Let's Grow Texas Ag tomorrow night at 630 on our sister station KMOL. It will also air here on KAVU at noon on Sunday. Well, a Texas man this week could become the first person executed in the U.S. under a murder conviction tied to the diagnosis of shaken baby syndrome. A judge rejected two efforts to halt the execution of Robert Roberson, scheduled for Thursday. Roberson was convicted of murdering his two-year-old daughter more than two decades ago, but his attorneys say Roberson is innocent. The shaken baby syndrome diagnosis is under increasing legal scrutiny. Roberson's advocates contend his daughter died of double pneumonia that progressed to sepsis. They say her illness was made worse by a combination of medicines now seen as unsuitable for children. When Roberson took his daughter to the hospital, doctors and nurses immediately diagnosed her with suspected abuse based on bruises and injuries to her head. Look at all the factors and determine what is the legal standard. I can't rule based on emotions, based on what 
I think it should happen long term. I have to base my rulings on the law and what's been presented. And based on all of that today, I find that the evidence does not justify recusal. So, Judge Evans, the motion is denied. Uh, Signing orders at this time, denying the motion to recuse and denying the motion to vacate. There's nothing further we are adjourned. Roberson's lawyers also say his unusual demeanor, which made police suspicious, was a manifestation of his autism, which went undiagnosed until 2018. The search for a missing mother of four in suburban San Antonio has now shifted to a recovery effort, according to authorities. They said their investigation led them to a landfill where they believe they will find Suzanne Simpson's remains. The 51 year old went missing more than a week ago. Almost Park Police said her husband, Brad Simpson, was arrested on a family violence charge in relation to his wife's disappearance. A neighbor told police he saw the couple arguing outside his window and they began physically fighting. The neighbor said he went outside to look for them and heard screaming coming from a wooded area. The woman's family previously said they were losing hope that she will be found alive. Today, brand new numbers on early voting. More than 5 million people already casting their ballots in what's expected to be a historically close race. Georgia starting early in-person voting today. Both candidates now focusing on their closing game with Election Day only three weeks away. ABC's Perry Russum is in Washington. Only three weeks to go until Election Day and both candidates focusing on the battleground states. High voter turnout in Georgia, a new record for the first day of early voting. Uh, I think this is an existential election. I really just want to make sure my vote counts. Former President Trump campaigning in Georgia. The most beautiful word in the dictionary is tariff. After talking economics in Chicago. We're going to bring the companies back. We're going to lower taxes still further for companies that are going to make their product in the USA. Georgia's Secretary of State says they are ready for long lines of voters. We've watched what Chick-fil-A has done over the years and how they've managed their lines, and we think that someone needed to do that in the election space, and that's what our focus has been. Vice President Kamala Harris campaigning in Detroit, Michigan, a city Trump mocked last week. Our whole country will end up being like Detroit if she's your president. Harris unveiling a new campaign strategy in Battleground, Pennsylvania playing clips of Trump rallies at her rallies. The worst people are the enemies from within. The enemy from within. He considers anyone who doesn't support him or who will not bend to his will an enemy of our country. Harris is running a Tim Walls in rural Pennsylvania. Vice President Harris knows that. She knows that our rural neighbors, that look, when things are hard and difficult, that's when we do it the best. And we owe them our full support to make sure that they can find an opportunity right now in their hometowns. Today, Trump was asked if he has spoken to Russian President Vladimir Putin since he left office. Trump said he would not comment on that, adding, if he did talk to Putin, it's a smart thing. Perry Russell, ABC News, Washington. Here in Texas, incumbent Republican U.S. Senator Ted Cruz and challenger Democrat Colin Allred will be debating tonight. Cruz is seeking a third six-year term while Allred aims to transition from the House of Representatives to the Senate. You can watch the debate at 7 p.m. on MeTV 22.1 KQZY or 25 Now 25.4. Those are over-the-air channels. If you are on Optimum Cable, MeTV is on channel 142 and 25 Now is on channel 133. Election Day is three weeks from today, Tuesday, November 5th. Well, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Crossroads Today. Hit the like button and click the notification bell when we're there to receive alerts. Well, stay with us. Coming up on 25 News Now at 6, FEMA says disaster relief funds are running low, but there's enough to help in the southeast. And the National Zoo's long, dark panda drought has come to an end. A look at the new arrivals today.
Welcome back. As FEMA responds to Hurricanes Helene and Milton, an agency spokesperson says it has roughly eight and a half billion dollars in its disaster relief fund. Despite the relatively low balance, the spokesperson says FEMA has the funding it needs to continue recovery efforts from both hurricanes. The balance is also a reflection of how it has been a year of nonstop disasters filled with tornadoes, wildfires and floods. FEMA recently received about $20 billion from Congress to respond to hurricane season after the agency ran out of money earlier this year. The FEMA administrator announced last week that about $9 billion of that was spent reimbursing other states for earlier disasters. Congress may be forced to replenish the disaster relief funds, but the House of Representatives isn't expected to return until after the November elections. However, lawmakers from states impacted by Helene and Milton are clamoring for further action if it's needed. Jury selection began Tuesday in the federal retrial of a former Louisville, Kentucky police officer charged in the shooting death of Breonna Taylor. Prosecutors say Brett Hankinson used excessive force and violated Taylor's civil rights when he fired shots into her apartment in 2020 during a botched police raid. The federal case was tried last year, but when the trial ended, the jury was deadlocked and the judge ordered a mistrial. A man who left his dog tied to a pole during Hurricane Milton is facing felony charges. The state attorney has charged the owner with aggravated animal cruelty after he admitted to leaving his dog on I-75 as he evacuated to safety during Hurricane Milton. The owner told investigators he was driving to Georgia to escape the hurricane, but left his dog Jumbo on the side of the road because he couldn't find anyone to pick up the dog. The Florida State Trooper uh, got a tip from a driver about the animal on the side of the road and diligently searched until he found the dog tied up. The trooper found the dog as water was rising to the animal's neck and Hurricane Milton was bearing down on Tampa. Now named Trooper, the dog is safe and will not be returned to the previous owner. Washington DC now has two new furry residents. The giant pandas Bao Li and Ching Bao landed in the US from China today. The pair now calling the Smithsonian National Zoo their home. As ABC's Zorin Shaw reports, they'll be on loan from China for the next decade. Two months after the San Diego Zoo received the country's first pandas in over two decades, the one that started it all will also get to continue its storied relationship with the world's cutest form of diplomacy. On Monday, the Smithsonian National Zoo, which started this exchange program with China in 1972, posted on social media that something, quote, giant was coming today via the FedEx Panda Express. In fact, they also stated that they would need to shut down the zoo as they welcome their new guests, Bao Li and Ching Bao. Join us. It's official. The news of any return at all was first announced back in May with the help of First Lady Dr. Jill Biden. That ended six months of unrest when the zoo's contract with the Chinese government expired. The pandas are coming back! And you know, in the past half century, the pandas at the National Zoo have become integral to DC's culture. Check out this local bakery that sells panda cake pops and cookies. We are super, super excited. And honestly, we never gave up faith. And these new pandas will be a little familiar since Bao Li's mother, Bao Bao, was born in Washington. And then First Lady Michelle Obama was present at the naming reveal of Bao Bao's brother, Bei Bei. Now, after months of anticipation, it appears that the wait is finally over once these beloved global ambassadors enter a quarantine for at least 30 days. However, our affiliate WJLA noted that there appeared to be new features in their enclosure, such as new hangout spots and even more cameras. Yay, more cute panda video! Danny New, ABC News, New York. And get that, you'll be able to stream live uh, whatever the pandas are doing at that particular time of day. So that is a good way of doing diplomacy with uh, cute bears like that. Anyway, folks, another sunny, warm day got up to in the 90s today. 93 is our current temperature. The winds are out of the southwest, which is a warm weather uh, wind. Uh, our high was officially 95, 10 degrees above our seasonal average. But guess what? Tomorrow, we're only going to be about 78, maybe even 80 degrees is a high temperature, 15 to 20 degrees cooler. All right, we'll be talking about that frontal system coming in in just a moment.
Well, good evening, everybody. Yes, another beautiful sun, sunny day. Problem is, uh, we're getting short on the rain department. Uh, just to give you a reminder, in July, we did get six inches of rain above normal. August was not that impressive. September was right at about average. But uh, since that time, October, we've seen no rain at all. So we need to get something going. Originally, we were thinking, well, the tropical stuff. Well, now that's looking less and less likely as things are moving in North America in terms of frontal systems and cooler air. Lots of sunshine over our area. The frontal system is right about here, uh, maybe as close as Dallas or certainly in Oklahoma. They've got that cool air beginning to drop down. It's going to be rolling through here. The frontal, t uh, well, the winds will shift around maybe about sunrise. Certainly by noon tomorrow, you'll feel that fresh north wind blowing in, giving us uh, some very pleasant temperatures and something a little bit more fall like, you know, a little a little autumn weather finally rolling into our area. We uh, look at the wind flow and you can see how they are out of the southwest. That is generally a dry air mass for us, and that's certainly what we got today. But as we took a look at the big picture, we don't have the northerly winds here just yet. So that is going to be moving fairly quickly overnight and by sunrise should be passing through our area. And then all of a sudden our fortunes have changed and we're going to be looking at much nicer weather rolling into our area for the rest of the week. Really, you're going to feel like, wow, maybe I should make some soup or something. High pressure is covering the Gulf of Mexico. That's very interesting and very important. I'll tell you why in a minute. Here are the current temp or these are the current temperatures right about now. And as we look at the big picture, watch this. It's 90 in Dallas, it's 66 in Oklahoma City, it's 49 in Chicago. Oh yeah, that sounds pretty good. Well, here's the cool air that's going to be drifting down into our area. Not that cold. I mean, it will moderate a little bit, but it's going to be a far cry from where we were last week. Uh, there you see the uh, system that's been trying to get organized. It keeps making these big uh, blooms of thunderstorms uh, during the daytime. And then, then you see, OK, well, then it's going to go around and get uh, circular motion. But it hasn't done that. Nonetheless, whether it does organize or not, it is going to be crossing the Central America uh, throughout Honduras and Nicaragua. Uh, no major problems as far as we're concerned. The second system, although it looks rather ominous, has a 60% chance of becoming a tropical um, storm, then when it gets here, I believe it's going to turn down south because high pressure is on top of it and it's not going to go through that uh, anytime soon. So again, as high pressure is uh, bringing in some cool, nice dry air into our region, we'll see those two systems sort of scoot uh, south of us uh, through Central America. There's number one and there's number two as uh, all this is now in control. So we're kind of turning the corner on our seasons here. We are looking at a gorgeous day. Look at this. You're not going to believe me when I say I, when I wrote it down, I said, I don't believe it. 77, the high tomorrow in Port La Vaca. Pretty good, huh? And then in Cuero, 78 and sunny. Not bad at all. It's all going to be courtesy of that north wind that will blow in early in the morning and lovely weather in the low 80s all the way through the weekend. That's your seven day forecast reminding everybody we do have a QR code and we'd love for you to scan that. That way you can put Crossroads today on your phone. Here's Shauna. All right, thanks a lot, Mac. Well, the big game is returning to Atlanta in 2028. The National Football League announced today that Super Bowl 62 will be played at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. This will mark the fourth time Atlanta has hosted the Super Bowl. The last time the city hosted it was in 2019. In a statement, NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell cited Atlanta's hospitality and sports and entertainment culture as to why it was a great fit for the game. The Super Bowl won't be the only big sporting event coming to Atlanta in the coming years. The city will be hosting the college football playoff championship, a World Cup and the Final Four. Meanwhile, football fans are focused on the next big game, Super Bowl 59, which will be played in New Orleans on February 9th. 2025 and from the big uh, football game of the Super Bowl to a big game on the court here locally. Max Williams joins us with a look at what's coming up in sports. Yeah, Sean, I mean volleyball. We got big action here tonight here in the crossroads between Victoria East and Victoria West. I'll tell you more in sports.
Now, yesterday we highlighted a big game between the Quero Gobblers and the Sinton Pirates, but what will we look at here tonight here at another Week 8 matchup? We're going to look to the Yoakum Bulldogs. They're going to be playing against, again, the Columbus Cardinals here in Week 8. And for Yoakum, they're 5-2. They beat the Hempstead Bobcats 55-14 last week. And Trey Cuellar, and you saw he was voted our, at our viewer poll yesterday as our Impact Player of the Week from last week there in Week 7. But he's going to have to be big time again because they're facing the number one team in Class 3A Division 1. They have a 6-0 record here for the Columbus Cardinals. And they have a star running back in Grayson Rigdon. He's one of the most explosive backs in the entire 3A here in Texas. And they also got one of the most explosive offenses in the entire 3A as a total as well for Columbus. So, Yoakum, they got a big challenge, but they have a star athlete that can probably match up with Columbus and wide receiver Xavier Barnett. He will be, again, a huge factor in this game. And for Yoakum, they're trying to keep building confidence. They've won three straight heading in this game here this week. They've been Hyde Park, Hempstead, and Blanco. So, if you like offense, I expect this one to be a high scoring game, and I think it's going to come down to which defense can make a stop there at the end of the day. Now from Cuero here to a team that here in the Victoria area, the St. Joseph Flyers, they travel to Katie St. John High School this Friday night. I caught with the star quarterback there in Aiden Aragon and talked about how about his leadership skills have helped out this team so far this season. I think we're, we're a younger team as uh, as of now, we're, we're a young team, so I think being a leader for, for the younger classmen and, uh, you know, I think uh, I've improved a lot on my decision making and getting the ball off faster to my playmakers so they can do their thing. And, um, you know, I think that's really it, um, just being a leader and being a better quarterback. Aragon helped keep bringing those leadership qualities there on the field. As again, I mentioned, they play against Katie St. John on the road this Friday night. Now from St. Phil Joseph football to some volleyball action. We got a rivalry game here between Victoria East and Victoria West. This game is huge for Victoria East as they are looking for their first win ever. Yes, first win ever for Victoria East over West tonight. East right now is 17 and 12 this season. They're trying to, you know, finish the season off strong as they still have star player Addison Azuda who leads a big way there for Victoria East. But West, they've had a great season this year. They are 34 and 4 and 8 and 0 in district play. And we're going to see who's going to win this rivalry game. Can Victoria East make some history or Victoria West take care of business? here tonight. Another volleyball action here between the London Pirates out of Corpus Christi and then the Calhoun Sand Crabs. And Calhoun, Calhoun is also having a great year as they are 31 and 3 right now. And two of their star players for the Sand Crabs are Kendall Vargas, who's had 2,000 digs or is looking to get 2,000 digs here tonight. And then Nava Rangel, she's surpassed over 1,000 kills already this season. So we're going to see if Calhoun can take care of business. We'll get some highlights from that game as well tonight at 10. That's going to do it here in sports. Shauna, back to you. All right, lots of excitement. Thanks, Max. Well, we're back in a moment with the story of an eight-foot alligator who goes shopping at a convenience store. Find out how one deputy's Gator Boys binge prepared him for the ultimate wrangling showdown.
Well, check this out. A Victoria County deputy wrangles a snappy suspect. Corporal Parma found himself face to snout with an unexpected guest. An eight foot alligator casually shopping at a convenience store in Placido. Inspired by his marathon binge of Gator Boys seasons one through 12, he's watched them all. <laughs> Corporal Parma was feeling like a gator wrangling pro and decided to take on this scaly troublemaker solo. <laughs> Armed with confidence and probably the theme song from the show playing in his head, he went in for the catch. After some jaws on action, Parma had things mostly under control, but as you can see there, he got a little bit of help from Texas yeah. game warden Jared Lewis. The Gator was safely evicted from its spontaneous shopping trip there in Placido and taken to a more wildlife friendly location. But big thanks to Corporal Parma and game warden Lewis for making sure this Gator did not get away with any five finger discounts. Yes. So, I know, you know wow. Max, you were just saying you wouldn't put yourself oh, in that no, kind of situation. No, not at all. If I had you a know, chance with alligator, I'd be like, I'm, tout me out for if, sure. If I watch Mission Impossible, I don't think I'm Tom Cruise. I'm, oh, I'm yeah. not going to go out there and do that yeah. stuff. Don't want to risk anything. I watch the show, yeah. but, but that's pretty <laughs> brave of him, mm. I, you got to admit. Just well, jump no, on him. <laughs> no alligators there, but you'll be down at the Calhoun County Fair yeah, tomorrow. That's right. Tomorrow, and, big uh, day down there at the fair. Uh, come by and see us. We'll be uh, probably, uh, they'll be judging, you know, they do all the judging of all the animals. So we'll be watching for that and we'll be live and it'll be a gorgeous day. Tomorrow's high yeah. temperature only 78. I'm looking forward to that's it. Nice. We'll be sure to join us back here tonight for 25 News Now at 10.